hey, we're about to dive into a conversation I had with my friend Katie from Totally Trans Pod, kind of centralized by the Trans Rights Readathon, touching on a conversation around detransition baby, being perceived, and kind of trans storytelling in general. However, this is the first kind of conversation I have had on my channel, especially filmed in my own space. So there is a definite learning curve here. So I guess this is just an introductory caveat to tell you that I am a little self-conscious about it, and it might be a little rough, but I think it is a really important conversation and hope you'll stick around for it. So without any further ado, let's get into the conversation. So I'm Melody, if you've been here before, if not, now you know. And this is my friend Katie from Totally Transpod and from Being My Friend Katie. Katie, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit more? Uh, hi, I'm Katie Coleman. I am a playwright and composer and uh, I guess podcaster. Ooh, I've never said that out loud before. I don't call myself a YouTuber out yeah, loud. Yeah, that's no good. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Woo! Okay, this is where it becomes very obvious that I'm very awkward, so. So I invited Katie here today to talk about storytelling and writing, particularly around the Trans Rights Readathon. And we, I guess, because you're helping me, are raising money for Brave Space Alliance. Oh, great. Yeah, and Trans Hoosiers also. But I couldn't find a specific charity that I really knew where the money would best serve. Trans Hoosiers is what you said. Yeah. I thought she said Trans Hooters. Both are probably technically accurate. Right, yeah, you know, like Femboy Hooters? You know the Femboy Hooters mean? Oh, never mind, it's a thing. Katie is my friend, obviously, and also I follow you on Twitter now because you have a Twitter now. You tweeted at some point about the book Detransition oh, right, Baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you said something about how you didn't want your cis friends to read it because you were afraid of being perceived too much. Correct, yes, that's and right. And I took that to heart, even though I knew you were joking. Yes. Because I wanted to give you space. Um, almost everything I say on Twitter is uh, is not serious, which I feel like is a good policy for Twitter in general, and we should assume that everything everybody says on Twitter is not 100% serious. I, I, think that, yeah. I think that that's a good policy to yeah. have, too. Having actually started the book now, because I didn't finish, admittedly, sorry, Sounds like, it's like your dedication it's, to the show is in 100% Melody. It sounds like book club. Remember when we were in a book club together? We, Remember when book club read books? I guess true. is what I, I should think say. technically the book club still exists. It's just it more does. of a club. I guess what I want to talk about is the concept of being perceived through this novel. Sure. Okay. Because when you tweeted that jokingly, I was like, okay, that makes sense. But then when I read it, I was like, I get it. Because it feels like... Even if it's not an accurate representation of everybody's experience, sure. it feels like a really personal kind of window into specific experiences. Yeah, and like the thing about like specifically this book is that it is, I mean, first of all, it is not the... You can pick it up if okay. you want. It's yeah. a digital copy. I should have, I have it on hardback and I should have brought it as a prop. You can see my shame yes. in the Kobo um, um, countdown there. The Kobo <laughs> countdown? In that it tells me about Ooh, how far... Six hours to go. Yeah, that's... Um, I, my focus has been bad. I'm going to blame okay, that's okay. the weather and my yeah. ears. Yeah. Um, like, so the thing about when the Transition Baby came out, just like... Just like Disney and their, you know, first gay character in every movie, um... Random House, probably, have, whoever have published it. Have a trans character in Disney yet? Oh, God, no. Yeah. no. I mean, well, Ariel, obviously, but other than that. Um, <laughs> yep. The, um, we can talk about Hans Christian Andersen, too. Sure. Um, Hans, however. Hachette, or whoever, whoever published the Transition yeah. Baby, made a big deal about, like, this is the first, like, trans story written by a trans person, published by a big five publisher, which is 100% not true. Yeah, as I say, that um, does not seem, I missed that publishing push, but also, yeah, I because mean, it came out in 2021, that can't be yeah, true. Yeah, no, it's absolutely not true, um, which is wild. But um, in a lot of previous, you know, books, even cent centering trans characters and everything, there is t the tendency to um, try to be as... Uh, neutral about the characters as much as possible neutral to positive mm -hmm. um and there's there's not been a, a great um there has not been a lot of examples of n negative uh, portrayals of trans people in books um and in stories in general i mean it's just like it's like any um you know marginalized community when they are represented in you know, when they do start being represented in film and, and television and, and media in general for a while like it's only super positive representation which is great but you know at a certain point it becomes unrealistic uh and so in this book 
specifically, she really gets into um, the, the psyche of specifically to um, trans women who are very different, but who also uh, have a lot of problems and um, negative personality types slash possible disorders. Um, and it is, and I love them. I think that they're great characters, but you know, you wouldn't necessarily want to be best friends with Reese from Detransition Baby. Um, but at the same time, you feel like you recognize her a little bit. Absolutely. Like, I'm, I am Reese from Detransition Baby, which is why I don't want to be friends with her. Um, I am not Reese from Detransition Baby, and by the way. I am friends with her. So it's always difficult to, to, to see your negative personality traits in a character in a book that you start to relate to. Um, even more so when those, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say personality traits, but the the way your brain works um, in something like that. Especially so when it is, and obviously, you know, any character in media is, is not a representation of everyone from that community, but unfortunately, a lot of people, anytime they see a character from a marginalized community in media, will take that person to represent all members of that community. And to a certain degree, uh, there are, you know, certain things about Reese that are representative of a lot of trans women, um, a lot of white middle class, um, 30 ish, uh, trans women at least. So it's, uh, so it's kind of embarrassing. It's like exposing exposure, you know, it's mm -hmm. not just like, this is what I, Tori Peters as the author, you know, have thought about these things and I'm going to take these thoughts and put them on the character. It's this thing that like we as a community don't want to talk about <laughs> That is like now in a you know New York Times bestseller that a lot of people have read because it's gotten huge attention with something, yeah. which is amazing. And probably, do you think part of that is due to it being positioned as like the first trans story yeah, of a major publisher? It's something that's you know literary and you know not um, completely unpalatable mm -hmm. for. Uh, the the Today Show yeah. uh, audience, uh, book and club people. So I, it's... Was it a Today Show? It was one of them. I don't know if it was Today Show or it was somebody's... It was in one of those big book clubs. Okay. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah, That's sure. a huge deal too. Yeah. In yeah. A way. I was telling you when you came in too, this idea, I think it really works for like the literary girlies yeah. because it has that thing I think a lot of books try to do. And I've talked about this on this channel before, obviously, this kind of messiness, which for me in a lot of books like Moshe can read a shock value for shock value's sake or as kind of mean. And here it feels incredibly intentional and personal. Yeah and raw in a way but it goes back i think to the vulnerability of being perceived that you were getting at yeah, absolutely and it feeling true it reading true these are real messy people yeah. doing real messy things yeah and you you understand that i mean like i i, sh I should say for those of you who've read the book i'm not a bug chaser um but a lot of the like the psychological um reasons why she does that is something that i do relate to um, I have not gotten to that part. Yet. It was at the very beginning. Like, oh. you know, she's sleeping with the guy who's HIV positive. Oh, yeah. okay. It's like a bug chasing kink is what they call that, yeah. I'm just not as up on the lingo. Sure, sure, yeah. That's what I'm here for. This is where it becomes obvious how cis I am. Mm. And straight, unfortunately. <laughs> we all have our flaws. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I think it's really interesting how this book, because it is so raw and different, and what it kind of means for trans storytelling on like a larger scale. Sure. So I guess if we want to transition into talking about trans storytelling more broadly, or even if you want to talk about how you conceive of trans storytelling or what it means to be a trans storyteller, sure. we can go to both. We can go down both roads eventually. I will let you pick which side we go down first or which path. Um, yeah, uh, you know, in terms of like, what it means for trans, trans storytelling, I, I, it means that, you know, more trans, because this was a success, more trans authors will probably get, you know, picked up by Penguin or, or whoever, you know, um, which is great because there are a lot of trans authors who are writing in that genre who are, have been getting rejected for years. And, you know, hopefully that this is something that will, you know, make more 
uh, you know, agents and stuff take a, take a chance on them, I guess. And to be an adult story, because I think Correct. we That's see... Correct, I mean. Yeah, we see a lot in, in uh, genre fiction, and we see a lot in YA. A, a lot in YA. Yeah, um, which unfortunately is under attack right now of course yeah i think that that's interesting too that we see a lot of this kind of germinate in ya before we see it translate to adult fiction do you think that's true of like of like all everything though are you saying we all grow up like we, we pull things with us as we grow up no, no no i just mean in publishing i think do you think that that thing that that change is now starting in in ya and and then getting pulled into like literary fiction I think for a long time, I would say yes. I think now we're seeing YA kind of wane in a way. Really? So I don't know if it's the same. It's the only kind of section of publishing that posted a decline for the last quarter. But I think that's a lot of other mm. reasons, including pricing, them not necessarily meeting their audiences where they are instead of where they think they are, or sure. what them to be, or where they were five years ago. Mm-hmm. But I'm also not a teen, so... I well, can't I speak am. To that. Yeah. So, um, so did you want me to, to talk about some other authors? Yeah. Is that what? Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Um, there, there's lots of great uh, trans authors in basically any genre that you want. Um, my personal favorite is probably uh, Casey Plett, uh, who writes short stories and novels, and um, she's amazing and very much in the vein of if you like Tori Peters, you'll probably like uh, Casey Plett. She writes about um, really fucked up uh, trans women doing terrible things uh but you love them anyway uh and she has a novel called little fish also um the probably the 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 godmother of trans fiction is imogen benny uh who wrote a book called nevada um about 10 11 years ago um which was you know not a Big Five publisher, I suppose. Was it which not? Is what, I don't think so. Okay. It is now. I think the reprint was okay. by some, like an imprint of somebody. That's interesting. Because yeah. it just got reprinted. Okay. Because it was out of print for a couple of years. But um, they're making a movie. Um, probably be out next year, I would say. I missed that. Um, yeah, it's um, it's the director of... It's Jane Schoenbrunn. Uh, they directed... Uh, um, We're All Going to the World's Fair last year. And they have a movie coming out this year called... I saw the TV glow, I think. You might correct me on that. I, you know movies in a way that yeah. I will never know movies. Um, well, Jane Schoenbrunn is a uh, trans filmmaker, and um, We're All Going to the World's Fair. It was a very low-budget horror movie that came out last year, and then A24 is releasing their second movie, I Saw the TV Glow, I think is what it's called, uh, which comes out this year, and they have announced that their, their third picture is uh, an adaptation of Nevada, so, uh, or Nevada, as the people who live there call it. But if I you can't live do that. in Nevada, tell us how you say yeah. Nevada. I'm from Tennessee. Um, it's a um, that is a, that's a that's a, a, a great um, novel. Um, we are in our on our podcast and our Discord. We're doing a book club uh, right now, and that's our that's our first book in our book club. Do you want to talk about that in your podcast briefly, so that anyone watching and is interested can sure. you know, get involved? Yeah. Um, we, uh, I have a podcast um, called Totally Trans uh, and with um, a couple of other people, and basically the premise is searching for the trans canon, where we take something that is not considered trans and do a trans read of it. So the first episode is about The Little Mermaid. Um, it's about, you know, uh, a girl who defies her family to... Change, magically change herself and get the body that she needs. You had an episode talking about Animorphs, Animorphs, right? yeah. Animorphs was, um, my first episode on the show was about Animorphs, which is, you know, something I read as a little kid. And, you know, when you reread as an adult, you can see a lot of things there. I mean, uh, Kay, Catherine Applegate, the author of Animorphs, is a trans ally. Her daughter is trans, um, and she has been very uh, supportive of the community and I think has has been um very accepting of the the love that trans people have for animorphs um which is which is great um kind of like a anti uh, jk rowling um so uh <laughs> but you know not nearly as successful so that's that's what we get um but animorphs is great um and uh yeah so the, there's a character in animorphs called tobias who gets um in the lore of Animorphs, you can stay... It's about these kids who morph into animals, I should say, in case you weren't alive in the 90s. Um, they they fight aliens. It's uh, it's better than it sounds. But they get the power to... They can turn into animals, basically, to, to fight aliens. And um, 
one of them, Tobias, uh, you can only stay in a morph for two hours. And so he gets stuck as a red tailed hawk. And so he has to like basically live the rest of his life as a hawk. Um, and eventually he gets the ability to turn into other animals again, but his, his body is now a hawk. He has to go back to be a hawk every, every two hours. Um, and it's especially because they're all first person and they switch perspectives every book. So the books that he talks about, the way that he talks about dissociation and um, body dysmorphia, basically, are very trans. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that, you know, obviously she didn't realize that she was writing about because those sorts of things, body dysmorphia and dissociation are not exclusive to the trans community, but they are something that, you know, makes you feel seen. So the podcast is about finding those things that almost universally are, are stories that are not aimed at the trans community. Occasionally, we, we did an episode on Detransition Baby, you know, we do talk about, you know, things like that occasionally, but usually it's about how we can see something in a character that other people don't consider trans and kind of take that character as our own. Um, and that's what our, our show is about. That's really like exciting to like think about like looking at things through different lenses yeah. and kind of queering the canon, as you said, I'm stealing your own verbiage. Um, yeah, our most recent, we, we recorded an episode about um, like classic Nintendo. Um, like Super Nintendo Nintendo? Like Nintendo Nintendo Nintendo. Um, I don't know if I go that back. Yeah. Go back that far in the N Nintendo lore. Neither do I, but our very uh, um, intelligent guest uh, told us all about it. Um, yeah, the, so in Mario Brothers 2, uh, the, the one where you've got the vegetables and stuff, and the one where you can, as I remember, you can play as Princess Peach. I definitely know what you're talking about. Um, it is the first one where you can play as the princess. I never... And she jumps, and then she her, her dress, like, acts as, a like, a parachute, so she, like, very slowly comes back down. I never got past the second level of Donkey Kong on my own on Super Nintendo. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Um... So this is, like, older than that. This is, like, from the 80s. Okay. So um, something we could play at, like, the arcade bar. Yeah, maybe. I don't know if they have a Mario arcade. I don't know. I'm not a huge video game person, um, so I'm not the right person to answer all these questions. But there's a I character named Birdo, who is a little... You Could you do the thing where you'd, like, take the graphic and put it on the screen? I don't know if I'm that good. I can't okay. make... I don't want to disappoint you with promises. Okay. Well, I'm going to promise the audience right now that she's going to do that. Um, and... Uh, so Birdo is this, like, pink dinosaur, um, who, uh, spits eggs at you, and in the original, like, instruction manual, it says that, that she's trans. Um. Oh! Yeah. This is Birdo, and she's been in other stuff, too. Okay, like, I recognize the character. Okay, so, oh, well. how's that? That, yeah, that's showing. Like that? yeah. 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 Um, Birdo. Wait, so what does the instruction manual say? The instruction manual says, um, he thinks he's a girl. Um, and which oh. is, you know, translated from Japanese and everything. So yeah. like, we're not sure like how much of it like tracks and everything, yeah. but like she's very feminine coded and she lays eggs and spits them at you. But also Yoshi, who is a boy dinosaur also lays eggs. And later. when does this episode come out? Um, several weeks from now. <laughs> okay, great. So this will be up before that. Oh, So great. everyone okay. look forward to this episode. Yeah, we talk about, and there's lots of other like classic Nintendo stuff. That and I will be linking something below to sure. get to the podcast. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. You'll yeah. be able to get there easily is what I'm saying. Yeah. And you should go to the podcast. Listen to Katie talk about Animorphs. Katie is so delightful geeking out about things and it's one of my joys <laughs> as a friend to be able to hear her geek out about things on the regular as she indulges me when I geek out about things or go on random diatribes. Absolutely. That's so, what friends are for. Friendship. So to bring it back, okay, kind of that you're looking on the podcast at the trans representation in stories that aren't necessarily inherently trans. Correct, yeah. And as a writer, how does trans storytelling kind of work within your writing? For my writing, I'm trying to write about characters that happen to be trans, basically. That's, that's the... Yeah. That's the goal. I mean, in many ways, like, their being trans affects them. And right. uh, in a lot of ways, my most recent play, which has been rejected from everywhere. So if anybody wants to do it. Um, do it. I, I haven't read it It's yet. called uh, The Madonna of Logan Square. And it's about, it's, you know, um, similar to Detransition Baby. It's about uh, trans motherhood. It is about a woman... A trans woman who magically becomes pregnant, basically. And it is visited by... Um, the uh, spirits of the divine feminine to help her, like, understand what her role could be so if like, she... 
a trans future version of a Christmas Carol. It's not. See, I say three spirits. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm Carol. sorry. I don't. I'm not it's, trying to misrepresent. I, know, I should probably like change. Maybe I should cut it down to two spirits. No, that's so probably on me. Carol. No, everybody says that. It's fine. <laughs> um, I have uh, I have another play about where a stuffed bear narrates to the audience, and everyone's like, "Oh, like Ted." No, not like Ted. I wouldn't say that to you because I've never seen Ted. I've never seen Ted either. Um, not, but not I assume really my it's genre. not. I assume it's not like that. This one's much sadder. Um, <laughs> that should be the tagline of your work. It's much sadder. <laughs> and really, than you anticipate, you go in and you're like, "Oh, this is great," and then you're like, "Wait a minute, Katie." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much that's that's what I'm going for. Yeah, I mean my. Like, as a writer, I'm constantly trying to to find that line between laughter and crying. Yeah. Like, if you can, if in this happens, because it happens in real life all the time. Like, so many times, like, at a time of, like, deep sadness, something very funny happens. And that, like, transition from, like, sadness to not being able to help but laugh at the, like, absurdity of this situation is something that I, I try to capture on stage a lot. Um... So a lot of my plays have a lot of humor in them, but I think ultimately most of them are very sad. <laughs> Which sucks because I want to write like a rom-com. Like I've been trying to write a trans rom-com for a long time. So after you write or finish, well, I know you finished the Madonna at Logan Square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. submitted it to submitting it places, yeah. but... Many places. <laughs> Rejected everywhere. I feel personally responsible because I didn't read for anywhere this year. They, well, that, that's your fault. Well, that's why. <laughs> to be fair, Sundance Theater Lab died. I know. So, yeah. but... Okay, so talk a little bit more about that play, and then talk about your, like, about that idealized trans rom-com. Like, I mean, like, well, so the thing is, like, and I, I said that, so at the O'Neill, uh, when I submitted to that one, they want, like, a little blurb about it, and so I decided, you know, why, why not? Why not just, like, because I'm always, like, in the, pre anytime I have to write, like, a statement about something, I'm like, I, I don't know, like, maybe you'll like I it. I hate the statement. It's awful. Even as a reader, I hate it. So statements. in this one, I was like, I'm going to write the trans angels in America, and I'm going to do it. Uh, so I, I tried confidence. Yeah. It didn't work. Um, Yet. It's possible, yeah. Um, I do. I, I'm not working on the play. I, I'm still, I would love, I would love people to do it. I think it's, it's good. Is it on New Play Exchange yet? Yeah, it's on New Play Okay, yeah. so if you have the New Play Exchange account, you can read it. If you don't have a New Play Exchange account, I think it's like $10 for the year. I admittedly need to re-up my account, but it's a place where you can just go and read plays from people of anyone that has submitted their plays to New Play Exchange. It's a really great resource. And every everybody does, basically. It, it really has become the the, the standard yeah. um, for, for playwrights. Everybody puts their, their plays on there now. Which, which is, is great. And you can recommend plays. You can write reviews for plays. But don't be weird about it. Like They'll delete them. Support the plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not good reads for plays. Let's put it that yeah, way. Yeah, it's only it's only recommendations. Like if it's if you don't like it, just keep it to yourself. That's the kind of rule. So yeah, I would I would love to do that play. I've I've tried. I'm I'm writing a a, a regular rom com with my friend right now. Um, we are gonna we're gonna shoot it. It's gonna be a whole thing. We're making oh, a movie, y'all. A movie. Yeah. The plan right now is that we have we're almost done writing the the feature length uh, rom com. Um, which is sadly a straight rom-com. Um, and, uh, my friend Emma is going to be the main character and I'm going to be the, uh, roommate best friend. So I'm going to be in a movie. Ooh. I, know, I haven't acted in many years. So how did it become, how did you get involved in a straight rom-com? Um, that, how, how did that? So it's, uh, Germany. My, my friend Emma and I wanted to, to work on something and she had this idea that she was working with previously with somebody else and I kind of like came aboard. Yeah. And we, we basically rewritten it from scratch. But and the, not saying that you can't write straight rom-coms, yeah. to be clear. I am bisexual. Um, some would say very bisexual. The, um, uh, the basic idea is the same. So it is about, it's like a rom-com slash horror movie. Uh, it's about that a talks. serial killer. Um, Nothing has ever seemed more like you thanks. than this premise. Uh, who is played by my friend Emma. And she uh, kills terrible men. Uh, and I'm her roommate best friend who like helps her like in her crimes and such. You help bury the bodies? Yeah. Okay. Or throw them in Lake Michigan as it, as it will. <laughs> So in, so the plan right now is that we have basically almost like, you know, we're about most of the way through writing the whole script. Um, we are going to take, there's three flashback scenes that are just the two of us characters. We're going to turn those into a short. We're going to film that as a way to raise money to smart. make the, the feature later. Yeah, smart. Hopefully we'll be able to short the, 
shoot this short film um, as soon as this fall. That's the goal. That's awesome. We're we're looking at raising the money and stuff. We've got a lot of people on board who are you know much more knowledgeable about filmmaking than we are. We've got some you know we've got church photography and all that pretty much straightened out, and it's just doing it now. So what about the trans rom com? you mm. dream of and does it have well, anything to do sorry to cut you off oh no you're fine um you had tweeted at one point about how you wanted to write a play around taylor swift's tis the damn season call me out um we are seeing taylor swift together that's true anyway so yes um called out again um did you you like review my twitter before we started I, this no i spend I'm trying not to spend as much time on Twitter, and luckily, it's kind of destabilization has helped with that dramatically. That's good, yeah. But yeah, you show up in my timeline a lot because we're actually friends. That's true, yeah. 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 Um, anyway, uh, yes. So I, I think every playwright should have a Christmas play. It can be whatever you want, uh, or like a holiday play, I should say. Um, but like those kind of plays are so marketable and so popular. It's kind of it's it's a wasted opportunity for me not to write a Christmas play also because I like Christmas um so I uh wanted to write a rom-com and I wanted to write a Christmas play so I decided to write a trans rom-com Christmas play um and it's sort of based on Tis the Damn Season it's just about someone who comes home and ends up having a, a fling with somebody yeah. while staying at their parents house at Christmas that's I mean that's the that's the gist of the song. You, you yeah. nailed it. Yeah. So that's that's the that's the the structure of it. Um, but in this case, she's trans and getting a divorce, and there's a lot of other things happening. So, but yeah, what what I wanted to write like a happy, fun trans uh, Christmas rom com is now a very sad uh, Christmas play about mostly divorce. It's when you're writing, like you do put yourself in everything that you're writing. So it is a lot about you know, just following paths to their natural conclusion. Yeah. Like what would happen if this happened and what would, what would you do? And then like, what would this character do? So when they say, when you say like characters write themselves, that's basically what you're talking about. Like yeah. everything has to be filtered through me, of course, yeah. because, but I can imagine how a character would react differently from the way that I would react. And then like that just, those decisions kind of, that becomes a, a decision tree that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's, that's how your characters for me at least, get away from me a lot. And, and it, so I end up writing something I didn't intend to write. And it shows your versatility as a writer. But also I think it goes back to a little bit to Detransition Baby, this idea of like these characters that so often it might be easy to look at trans narratives and kind of try and draw parallels with the author. Like I think we unfortunately do with authors all sure. the time now in a way yeah. that we shouldn't. Yeah. But it's this idea that no, like these characters can be as messy and flawed and diverse from their kind of germ of an idea as necessary. And these like characters take on a life of their own. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But like there is, there, there's, there's a piece of, of you in, yeah. in, in writing. And I think, I think Tori Peters has admitted that, you know, she's a bit of a Reese. I too am a, a bit of a Reese, sadly. Like, oh man, how much have you read of this? I I am basically to just where I'm forgetting her name, the K name. Katrina. Katrina has basically talked to her mom and is like, She's gonna do yeah, it. let's try this. Should we talk about the plot of the book? To people? Yeah, oh, okay. yes, that might help. Sorry, guys. So Detransition Baby is about three characters, basically. Um... Reese, Ames, and Katrina. And Reese is a trans woman. Uh, they're all in their 30s. Uh, Reese is a trans woman um, who is pretty miserable and is kind of in this spiral of, like, um, seeking out um, uh, dangerous sex. Um, Ames is a former, is a detransitioned former trans woman who... It's hard to talk about Ames because, like, on multiple occasions you get the idea that they are still a trans woman, but currently are living as a man. I would like to talk about Ames, though, just to put a pin in that. Sure, yeah. Um, Ames uh, lived as a, as a woman for six years, uh, detransitioned because of something really terrible that happened, um, and is now currently living as a man, started having an affair with his boss, Katrina, who's a cis woman. Ames thought that he was sterile because he had been on HRT for six years. And as we're learning, there's actually been a study recently, as we're learning, that is not generally the case because that's what they tell us, that when you take HRT for a certain amount of time, you will become sterile. And it seems 
um, that that is is not true, um, basically. Wow. Um, Science. Yeah. So he uh, gets Katrina pregnant, um, thinking that he was sterile, and then the two of them uh, kind of decide that... Oh, and Ames dated uh, Reese for many years uh, until she detransitioned and they broke up. The pronoun problem there. Is yeah. Like, it's back and forth. Yeah. It's hard to say. Um, but it feels totally natural and fluid within the narrative. To switch it, yes. Yeah. So basically the idea is, because Reese has always wanted a baby, Ames kind of comes up with this plan that maybe the three of them could co-parent the baby together because uh, Ames doesn't feel comfortable being a father, which... Same. And it kind of gets progressively messier from there. But the, the structure of the of the, the book also, like, every other chapter is a flashback to either uh, Reese or Ames um, years ago in their relationship. And so a lot of the storytelling is told through that. I found the idea of Ames very interesting because, and I think that the narrative direct, directly addresses this, this idea that we we don't talk about detransition. Oh, sure, yeah. And so, and I'll admit that it made me a little uncomfortable for the reasons the narrative then later exactly calls out, this idea that kind of exploring the complexities of it kind of feels like giving voice to something you shouldn't be, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's hard because there are some detransitioners who have joined up with TERFs and Nazis and and people who have like become very critical of, you know, what they call gender ideology um, and have become members of the gender critical movement. But the, that is not the majority. Um, first of all, I think... I, I shouldn't do. I shouldn't throw out figures because I'm not sure if they're accurate. But very, very, very few uh, people who transition and detransition, and very, very few of those people who do tr detransition end up actually not being trans um, people. Um, on the Daily Wire, will try to make you think that that is not true, and that doctors and trans people are indoctrinating people to think that they're trans. But it's just it's it's not true. Um, the 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 tiny 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 minority of of these people, which basically you can list on one hand, I will not do that, uh, but who have both one detransition and two become a member of these far right movements. It, they bring these people out, and it's the same people. And even some of those people have have retransitioned and gone back because a lot of people who detransition detransition for reasons outside of of gender um, most a lot of people detransition because they are not in a community that would support their transition and they detransition temporarily and then end up retransitioning uh, some people obviously don't um, in this book uh, well, I won't spoil it. You can but spoil it. I'm going to finish it. It, it, does, it doesn't say uh, whether Ames retransitions, but it's, it's l greatly implied uh, that he will. And I think that that's interesting because it's like, it, not that specifically, but kind of like building off that idea. It gets into the internal of that and the kind of conflict in a way where that is a subject that feels messy and uncomfortable, but it makes you kind of understand the fullness of it and how hard that choice was. The hardest thing in the book for me to read is the is the flashback to what causes Ames to detransition. Like it's We do get the specifics of that. Yes. Thank you for that um, uh, warning. Because... It's the most horrific thing that uh, most trans women could probably imagine, basically. Okay, that's good to know because I've gotten like the sprinkling inklings yeah. and that was enough to be like, yep, totally understand. Yeah. Okay, okay, good to know. You talked about some other trans books already. Oh yeah, and then we got, to, uh, we went off on a, on a tangent and I got away from them. I've got um, a couple of others. Yeah, uh, Charlie Jane Anders. Um, oh yeah, is you a, do love yeah. Charlie Jane Anders. Uh, science fiction uh, writer. Uh, she writes adult books, she writes YA books. Right now she just finished her, um, her YA trilogy, which is uh, Victory is Greater Than Death is the first one, and the other two titles have escaped me, but they're very cool, and we the third one's not out yet, um, but they are very cool and weird and extremely kind of uh, heady, uh, um, for especially for, uh, for, for YA. Um, I think they're, they're really cool. Um, hopefully the third one is good. Um, April Daniels, uh, who wrote these two books and uh, kind of disappeared. Um, uh, Dreadnought and Sovereign, which are uh, about a trans superhero. Um, they're really cool and fun and also traumatic. There's also a lot of trauma in all of these books because it's kind of disingenuous to try to imagine uh, a 
a, a world uh, that trans people have to live in without some kind of like danger or trauma, I guess. Um, I guess so that's that's a warning for all of these, I think. Um, Casey Pletta mentioned uh, Maya Dean, uh, Wrath Goddess Sing, which uh, came out this past year, which is uh, super cool. She's nominated for the Nebula? I or, out of the game. I think it's the Nebula. Uh, and the Lambda um, Literary Award as well. So it is about, uh, it's the story of uh, what if Achilles was a trans woman. Oh. Um People is, love Achilles. Yeah, it's it's super cool. Um, it's about the um, the Kali, uh, which is like Athena's squad of uh, trans women warriors living on this island. It, it rules. Um, uh, Gretchen Felker Martin uh, wrote a horror novel called Manhunt, which is about a future where cis men are hunted down for their testosterone. You um, are so excited right now. Uh, it's uh, it's very cool. Um, and then there's like the 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 classics of the 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 YA um, genre, Meredith Russo, um, uh, Fellowship Girl, yeah, Mason Deaver, uh, Aiden Thomas, um, like Cemetery Boys, yeah. I love it so much. Um, those are those are all. Uh, great um, teen novels um, for sure, but um, you know, hopefully there'll be uh, there'll be a lot more. And you also love lesbian romances, right? I do love lesbian. I love all romances um, equally. Um, probably sixty forty. Um, let's not get into that. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I do. I didn't write down lesbian romance uh, authors. I, I forgot to do that. I mean, like, part of it is just, like, the world is so terrible recently. I've been, um, a lot of what I've read the past, like, two years has been uh, light, like, rom-com I stuff. I don't think you were alone in that. So yeah, so I've been definitely been on an escapist kick recently with uh, with my reading habits. But um, yeah, a lot of a lot of lesbian, a lot of romance novels in general. I read, I, I love the Emily Henry books. I've been reading, I've been reading Akatar. Lesbian rom coms that I have liked. Uh, I, you liked the Delilah Green books, right? Is that the yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. Astrid Parker can't fail is the second one. And Delilah Green doesn't care. Delilah Green doesn't care. Astrid Parker doesn't fail, and then the third one is not out yet. But um, but yeah, that's a. Um, lesbian rom com uh, series. It's it's more rom coms that I'm yeah. into than like romance. Yeah. Um, Which I feel like is where the genre is kind of going anyway. So yeah, yeah. Um, I'm because, gonna blame you on that then. because I, I love rom coms. Do you find okay? This is moving. This is moving into a different sure. sector. Tangent time. Do you find that a lot of these romance rom coms are actually rom coms or are just like romance with a different angle? Because some of them their build is rom coms, and I'm like, this is just a romance. You can call You're it talking a about romance. asking if it's funny. Yeah. Um. Yeah. See, I mean, like, you know, and you know. how how funny are a lot of rom coms? I mean, the problem with with rom com, and I watch a lot of rom coms. Like, it's kind of my thing. Um, she knows movies. The thing about like rom com, and why so many rom coms are terrible, is that they're, they're 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 not getting like what it is about rom coms that that do appeal to a lot of people. Like, you can make a terrible rom com like Leap Year, um, which I've not seen Leap Year oh, it's yet. awful. It's uh, which is wild because it's um, it's uh, it's Amy Adams. Yeah, I do love Amy Adams. Um, Except Disenchanted was also awful. So. Yeah, Disenchanted's not good. But um, but yeah, and it it it's missing everything that makes a rom com good. Like part of the reason why a lot of people like rom coms is because they're comforting, and they are comforting because there's a certain formula that you can follow. Like, you know, when you start watching it, that nothing really terrible is going to happen and ruin your night. Um, I feel the same way about horror movies, strangely. Like, horror movies are predictable. Like, even though it's something bad happening, because I know it's going to happen, it doesn't, like... <sighs> I love that for you, but I'm too... I don't understand how to describe it. It's comforting for me to watch, like, especially older horror movies because, like, it's like, oh, this is this part of the movie. This is when this happens. But, and okay, it's, but it like, makes me... It, it but makes me it's but the nice. music and the sound design doesn't, like, aggravate your anxiety? No. Well, I'm not a very anxious person. I have maybe, depression, but not anxiety. <laughs> maybe that's the secret. Again, um, I think the reason why I think I tend to, to prefer rom-coms is that they're mostly contemporary. Um, they generally don't have, like, a whole lot of sex, which is not really my thing. Like, I'm not, like, 
in or erotica. I mean, like, it's not really my thing. Like, I'm fine reading it. Like, the Akatar series, like, mm-hmm. tends to trend that way as yeah. they go on. Um, like, the fifth book is is largely erotica, I would say. Okay. Um, I have not read it, so yeah. I will take your word for it. Um, and it's not, it's not bad. Mm-hmm. It's just not my favorite thing to read. Yeah, this, this book is a lot more emotionally vulnerable. It's like a raw gaping wound in a way that I didn't expect. Yeah, it's very, um, it's rough. It's a rough read, um, for anybody, I think. Um, it is, uh, a lot of, a lot of trigger warnings, uh, on, on that book for sure. And it, it makes me very aware as I should be. You know, kind of, I like where it calls out. It's very good at kind of exploring intersectionalities Mm -hmm. and privilege. So it's, it's, I think, a great exploration while still looking and maneuvering those intersectionalities in a way that I don't know. I think we're getting better at, but recognizing the different gradients and levels of things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So as we kind of like circle the drain here of... (laughs) Conversation. Is that what you call the end of your show? Circling the drain? Don't well, do that. It's not a show either. It's usually me just babbling on about something. Is it on YouTube? Yeah. It's a show. Okay. Yeah. We are a show now, friends. Congratulations. So is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Plug? Anything? I mean, I talked about the movie and I talked about the podcast. Yeah. So those are the and most... I will link the podcast below. That's... I know it's on... Apple Podcasts. It's on everything, yeah. It's I don't know anything else about podcasts. Totally Trans uh, Podcast is what it's called. Um, yeah, we're on Twitter at Totally Trans Pod. I'm on Twitter at KT of the Lake. Um, that's, uh, that's about all I got, yeah. Well, this has been a delight. Yeah, I too. hope it's been a delight for you all as well. And thank you for kind of going with, because this is the first time I've had anyone else on camera with me. And that means that I've not set up a shot for more than myself. So thanks for joining me, Absolutely. everyone. Yeah. Out into the void. Yeah. We're going to make it awkward at the end here, like I'm really good at doing. But like and subscribe if you feel like it. Check out Totally Trans Pod. Read something good. And yeah. Bye. Bye.